Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Happy Sunday. Hope you guys are all enjoying a uh, nice, mellow weekend wherever you are in lockdown. Hope everybody's safe and healthy and all that good stuff. Uh, today, we got a kind of a special show. So I've been actually talking about doing this for a couple of weeks, and I've been thinking about doing it for a lot longer. I wanted to kind of just take like a half hour or so just to kind of reminisce on a lot of those great guitar heroes that we've lost over the years. And I'm talking about, you know, the, the, either the ones who left us way too soon at a very young age or those who we had the uh, the lovely chance to be able to listen to their music well into their elder years and, you know, then they passed and left us. So the guitar heroes who are no longer here, this is kind of like a little tribute show to them. I'm going to, again, I'm not going to list every single one of them because there's so many, uh, but I'm going to pick a bunch of my favorites, okay? I'll tell, talk a little bit about each one of them, uh, maybe some of my favorite music from them, favorite albums, the guitars they played, what, you know, any live shows that I've seen of them where I can tell some stories, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I got a bunch others that uh, I'm going to kind of give some mention. I may not talk as much about, but uh, you'll know the ones that are probably the nearest and dearest to me by how much uh, I discuss them. So there's a lot of them. Obviously, like I said, too many to really talk about in one episode, but I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. So first and foremost, uh, I have to do Jimi Hendrix at the top of the list, right? Jimi left us in 1970 at the very young age of 27. You know, really, Jimi was only at the forefront of modern music for just a very short time, right? You're looking at, what, th three years, right? Three years and then he was gone. Are you experienced in Axe as Bold as Love and Electric Ladyland, Band of Gypsies? I mean, some great, you know, the Woodstock performance, the Monterey Pop performance, right? Played Stratocasters, right? Occasionally you'd see him with a Flying V or an SG. I think there you can even find a picture or two out there of him playing a Les Paul, but mostly it was Strats, right, for the most part. Uh, some great songs. I mean, this guy just, like, revolutionized the guitar. Probably the, you know, arguably you could say uh, Clapton or Beck, but I think Hendrix was the first, like, guitar god who, who totally revolutionized music. All right, his use of feedback and fuzz and wah-wah, okay? And the cool little effects boxes like the, the Univibe, okay? All, all sorts of uh, studio trickery. I mean, he just, you know, he played the blues. He had this kind of, like, acid, psychedelic, psychedelic thing going on. His music was really heavy for the time, right? Some great songs, you know, Machine Gun, one of the greatest guitar solos of all time. You know, Voodoo Child, Spanish Castle Magic, Purple Haze, Isabella. I mean, some, you know, a groundbreaking player, all right, that uh, his influence is still being felt today. All right, and I think today, even today, you can still listen to Jimi Hendrix music and it still sounds pretty fresh. <clears throat> there was never anybody like him, right? One of a kind. Uh, Tommy Bolin. Okay, guy who kind of came about a few years after Hendrix passed away. Tommy left us even younger at age 25 in 1976. Okay, kind of came up with the band Zephyr. All right, he then was one of uh, this the second replacement for Joe Walsh in the James Gang. All right, he also replaced Richie Blackmore in Deep Purple. Okay, he did some cool <clears throat> guest appearances on some very cool fusion albums, right? Billy Cobham's Spectrum. Alphonse Mouzon's Mind Transplant. All right. He played lead guitar on the first Moxie album. Very good Canadian hard rock band because he was recording in the studio next door. He says, hey, why don't you come in and help uh, help us out, play some guitar solos on the album. All right. Some, you know, Come Taste the Band, that one album he did with Deep Purple. Very good album, very different. Um, James Gang, he played on the, the Bang album and the Miami album. Both really good albums. Very underrated James Gang albums, in my opinion. Of course, he released those two solo albums, Teaser and Private Eyes. Okay, and then, then he was gone, right? But some great songs. I mean, you know, Getting Tighter off the, the uh, Come Taste the Band album. Dealer, You Keep On Moving. A lot of great songs on that album. You got Standing in the Rain, Devil is Singing Our Song, Alexis. Those are all James Gang songs. Well worth seeking out. Fantastic guitar playing. Funky, right? Stratus and Quadrant 4 from the Billy Cobham album, all right? Wild Dogs, a lot of great solo stuff. Wild Dogs, great song, a lot of good stuff. Uh, again, left us at age 25, way too soon. Uh, mostly he played Strats, uh, but you do can't you can find him playing some Les Pauls on and some old clips and uh, photographs and things like that, but mostly uh, I've seen him play Strats. Um, great player. He had kind of like a, a bluesy 
jazzy slant to his playing. All right. A lot of people say that, uh, you know, it was Jeff Beck here and Tommy Boland playing with uh, Billy Cobham and Alphonse Mouzon that led him along with listening to John McLaughlin, which led Jeff Beck to start to go into the fusion realm. Okay. Very, very cool player for Tommy Boland. Um, if you can get like any of the rare live stuff that's out there, live albums, uh, well worth hearing out. The guy could rip. He could rip. Very good player. Gone way, way too soon. One of my absolute favorites of all time, uh, Gary Moore, okay, who left us in 2011 at age 58. A very sad day for me. Uh, I remember I was actually, my wife and I had uh, gone into New York City for like a three-day weekend just to go into the city and just have some fun, whatever. And I think it was like kind of like a late um, Valentine's Day gift for my wife went to the city and we were actually on the bus coming home when uh, I heard the news that Gary had passed and I was just devastated devastated um what a player what a player Irish guitar legend um you know he uh, came up playing in a band called Skid Row not to be confused with the U.S. Skid Row um he had a st- couple stints in Thin Lizzy right he played on the Black Rose album fantastic album uh, he played in a very cool jazz rock band called Coliseum 2 which was the John Heisman second version of Coliseum after the first Coliseum um, then of course he went into a long solo career in the 80s played mostly hard rock and heavy metal then eventually became more of like a straight blues musician doing a lot of very cool blues albums but no matter what era of Gary Moore it's all fantastic uh, mostly played Strats and Les Pauls and very rare you see him playing anything else okay Adept on both of them. You know, he played a lot of uh, strats during the 80s when he was doing the um, more of the heavier type thing, right? Using that whammy bar and just, uh, you know, ripping it up. Uh, during his blues years, he mainly played Les Pauls, okay? And during the uh, Thin Lizzy period, he also played Les Pauls. But, uh, man, some great albums. Like I said, Black Rose uh, solo albums for me. You know, Corridors of Power, Victims of the Future. Man, I played those to death. To death. All right, a lot of great albums he released during the '80s, you know. And then you've got the uh, still got the blues and that whole era, you know. Some of my favorite songs: "End of the World," "Shapes of Things," great version of that Yardbirds classic. Uh, Always gonna love you, Parisian walkways, one of his signature tracks. Uh, of course, still got the blues. All right, helped revive his career. Victims of the Future, The Messiah Will Come Again, his excellent rendition of a classic from Roy Buchanan, The Loner, another great instrumental tune. Just a guy that I miss every single day. Every day. <clears throat> All right, we're going to stay in uh, Ireland, right? Why not? You know who's coming next, right? Rory Gallagher. Guitar legend. <clears throat> okay. Always had those flannel shirts and that beat-up Fender Stratocaster, right? That's 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 the perfect example of a relic Strat, right? So many people now want to have a guitar that looks just like that, all beat up, paint faded and scratched, and it's just got that worn in look, right? And Rory played that thing all the time, all right? He passed away in 1995 at a uh, young age of 47. Okay, some highlight albums uh, for me: Calling Card, Tattoo, the live stuff, Irish Tour, 74, Stage Struck. Okay, some great songs, Tattooed Lady, A Million Miles Away, Moonchild, Shadow Play. Also love his stuff with the, his early band, Taste. Okay, if you want to hear one of the greatest live albums of all time, go check out Taste's performance at the Isle of Wight Festival. Okay, from what, 1970. Killer. Just a, a great player who is just adept at playing ferocious blues rock as he was straight slow blues, acoustic like Delta Blues. Okay, he was a killer slide player um, with just a, he had just like a precision, um, energetic attack on his guitar that uh, was technical as well as it had tons of feel uh, and groove. Just a, an amazing, amazing player. And he was a great singer too. Something I also want to mention, Gary Moore, also a fantastic singer. Both of these guys were just as strong singers as they were guitar players. And both very much missed. Two of the greatest talents to come alongside uh, Phil Lynott, um from Ireland, in my opinion. Just uh, amazing player, Rory Gallagher. Next up, uh, how about Stevie Ray Vaughan? Okay, Texas blues man. 
extraordinaire, left us in 1990 at the young age of 35. Sadly, not long after he got his life back together, got sober, okay, was playing better than ever, dies in that uh, terrible helicopter crash after a festival. Um, you know, came up, got known playing on David Bowie's Let's Dance album releases, uh, Steve Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble, Texas Flood, okay, couldn't stand the weather, okay, two of my favorite albums by him, a couple more albums throughout the decade, um, Tin Pan Alley, Texas Flood, Lenny, couldn't stand the weather title track, Come On, Part 3, some of my favorite songs, Cold Shot, all right, Crossfire, a lot of really good songs. He was a guy who could play rock and roll. He could play, you know, straight blues. He could play jazz. He can do, he was a big Hendrix fan. He played some great covers of old Hendrix classics. He was a fiery player, but he could do, you know, get real gentle and do some really tasty stuff. Uh, tremendous talent. You could tell he had really strong hands, right? He just would wrench all sorts of sounds out of that Stratocaster, which was his main guitar. All right. Another guy who had that guitar that looked like he had lived and slept with it for 20 years. Right. You could tell that thing was played. Right. Much missed. Much missed. Next up, <clears throat> going to go way back. Mr. Paul Kossoff. All right. Member of the band Free, one of the great British blues rock bands of the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, he was not a technical player, but he was all about feel. He had a tone and a vibrato that is just absolutely legendary. Okay, he died at age 25 in 1976 uh, after you know many year battle with uh, with drug addiction. Okay, which took way too many of these guys. You know, Hendrix, Tommy Bolin. You know, all these guys. A lot of these guys had problems with the uh, drinking and drugs. I mean, it's just. Comes to the territory, I guess. But, uh, you know, Paul's playing on that Tons of Sobs album, the first free album. Incredible. All right. Fire and Water album. Incredible. All those free albums are great with some really tasty, stinging, biting lead guitar tones. Okay. He was a Les Paul connoisseur. Got his Les Paul standard up there, playing all sorts of biting, bluesy leads. And, man, that vibrato just with, with one note, he just slays you. All right. You know, walk in my shadow. I'm a mover. The hunter. Go listen to the free live album and listen to that live version of Moonshine. Man, it's not fast, it's not technical, but man, that solo just like goes right to my inner soul. That's the mark of a great player, all right? His solo and all right now, classic. Mr. Big, classic. Ugh, a great player. Paul Kossoff, one of, one, of the, uh, one of my favorite Les Paul players of all time. All right, I'm, I'm actually considering doing an entire show on this guy. At some point in the not too distant future, if you're interested in seeing that, let me know. But I think I'm going to do it regardless. Um, Alan Holdsworth. There's really so much you could talk about this guy because he's got so many great albums on its on his own. But he's played with so many other artists and bands in multiple genres, and contributed such amazing guitar work that it's like he I I just have this like inner thing going on that I got I just got to do a show on Holdsworth and so at some point and just kind of touch on all aspects of his career because I think it's worth it but you know he left us uh, not long ago 2017 at age 70 he lived lived a nice long life uh you know unfortunately I think Holdsworth never got the due that he should have gotten you know he's one of the most influential respected guitar players of all time There's nobody like him all right and he's played on so many classic recordings and you know, so many of his peers just l always looked at him as the master. And just the guy never, you know, he should have been a uh, wealthy, healthy guy, you know, reaping the rewards of all the great stuff he did. And it just never really happened for him. Really sad. Really sad. But again, he lived to be 70. I guess he lived a nice long life and did a lot of great things. And we'll never forget him. And, uh, you know, man, his album, I O U, right? His solo on the Metal Fatigue. All right, great solo. There's so many great solo albums. I could just list them all up, and I'm going to save it for that show I'm going to do. He, he was on the Bundles album by Soft Machine. Great album, okay? Uh, he did two albums with Life, Tony Williams' Lifetime. Believe it's one of them, you know, Million Dollar Legs. Uh, he was on that first UK album, okay? He's on the Jean-Luc Ponty classic Enigmatic Ocean, okay? He played on Bruford's uh, Feels Good to Me and One of a Kind albums, all right? 
Um, just so many, so many great appearances. He did some cool stuff with, uh, you know, Frank Gambale and uh, some Stanley Clark and uh, so many, so many great albums with some just groundbreaking solos and, and guitar work. Uh, go check out Hazard Profile. That's uh, like the long suite that he did on that Soft Machine album, Bundles. Hazard Profile is killer. Uh, Snake Oil and Red Alert from the Tony Williams Lifetime period. Uh, Letters of Marquis and Devil Take the Hindmost, two of his great um, songs from his early solo career. In the Dead of Night off the UK album. I mean, so many great tracks. Um, early on, he mainly played an SG, Gibson SG. Go figure, right? Started to play a bunch of strats, Charvels, okay, in the... 80s uh he eventually uh also he was using that syntax contraption right some people love it some people don't uh then he started playing uh, he was playing ibanezes and carvins he was doing a lot with the headless guitars without the headstock so he did a lot with steinberger early on then he had carvin make him a custom uh headless guitar so he was really big in the later period of guitars without headstock so an amazing player he just had this kind of fluid legato uh, style that just used these really um, ridiculous chords and just blazing runs that just looked effortless. Uh, and again, he mostly played like jazzy or rock style music, but very atmospheric um, kind of s- stuff. Just hard to explain. There's never anybody like him. Just an amazing, amazing player. One of the true revolutionaries. I think just as much a revolutionary player as Hendrix was. Unfortunately, he just never kind of got the attention that he deserved, in my opinion. Uh, Next up, Terry Kath from Chicago. Okay, Uh, an incredible player. Left us in 1978 at age 31, okay, due to a mishap while cleaning and playing around with his gun, okay, accidentally shot himself in the head and tragically left us before what many predicted would have been an eventual solo career because he was, from all accounts, he was looking to uh, leave Chicago uh, because he was not really into the direction they were going in. In the late 70s, they were going for more commercial music. And I can only imagine what like a Terry Kath solo album would have been like. You know, it's incredible to even think about it. Uh, but man, that first Chicago Transit Authority album, some of the most outrageously great guitar playing you're ever going to hear. All right, Chicago 2, Chicago 3. Most of those Chicago albums from the 70s have some red-hot guitar work and vocals from Terry Kath. This guy was a great singer, too. Really husky, kind of bluesy, uh, soulful voice. All right? That Live at Carnegie Hall Chicago album is filled with great guitar work from Terry Kath. The Live in Japan album also. You know, songs like South California Purples, Question 67, 68... Poem 58, for crying out loud, is like one of the most molten guitar extravaganzas you'll ever hear. All right? They're Chicago's remake of I'm a Man. Killer work from him. Liberation, In the Country, Make Me Smile. All great songs that feature killer guitar work from Terry Katz. Some of them got his vocals, too. Just amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, And he mostly played uh, Telecasters and Stratocasters. He was mostly a Fender guy. All right? He could... He could make those guitars scream uh and he just was really good at using fuzz uh and he was a great wah-wah player as well loved cranking on the wah-wah pedal um but just he did it was like he had a bluesy style but it could be very explosive great great player much missed much missed johnny winter all right texas blues man right left us night uh 2014 at age 70 um yeah, I haven't been telling my live stuff. You know, I'll get back to some of that. I'll, I'll go back. I'll, at the end, I'll go back over and talk about some of these guys that I've actually that I've had the chance to see live. Uh, Johnny Winter, I actually got to uh, to meet very, very not long before he passed away. Uh, he actually was playing a gig here in this area, and he was doing a signing at uh, on his bus, his tour bus, pulled up to Rock Fantasy in Middletown, New York. Steve Keeler uh, set that all up, and I actually got to go on the tour bus and meet with Johnny, and I got him to sign one of my CDs, and he was a shell of himself at the time, barely talking, barely moving. Um, but it was cool to meet him anyway. But, you know, man, those albums, Second Winter, Johnny Winter and Still Alive and Well, uh, the live albums captured live, right? Um, some great songs, Highway 61 Revisited, Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo, Prodigal Son, Boney Maroney. You know, he, he did a lot of covers and made them his own. And he was just, he could do the straight old style blues. Uh, and he was also a great rock and roll player too. 
Uh, he mostly played uh, Gibson Firebirds, right? But later on, he uh, was into the headless guitar thing, too. He had a, a laser, which was a custom-made headless guitar, kind of patterned after a Steinberger. Um, but mostly, most people just remember him as a Firebird player. He was a killer slide player as well. Uh, and he had a good voice, very unique voice. But man, in his youth, he was a blazer. Could play really fast, too, with a lot of soul. Another guy greatly missed. Randy Rhodes. You know, doesn't get more tragic than this. Left us in 1982 at the tender age of 25, just as he's starting to really make a name for himself with Ozzy Osbourne's Blizzard of Oz. And then two albums in, he's gone. Right? Tragic. Uh, probably one of the guys that you can easily say if he would have lived, um, probably be probably the most respected guitar player out there today or one of one of the top guys. Because right? he was well on his way at the time. Uh, you know, those two albums, Blizzard of Oz, Diary of a Madman. You know, if you want to go back a little further, he was in the first incarnation of Quiet Riot. All right. Showing a little bit of his metal there. But really, it came out big time on those Ozzy albums and tours. I had a chance to see the Blizzard of Oz tour with Randy. It was the first concert I ever saw. Pretty special. He was up there with his uh, polka dot Jackson Flying V, right? He also had his uh, white Gibson Les Paul Custom. Those were his main guitars. Okay, he had the shark fin Flying V and then the, and the, the black black and white polka dot one and the white Les Paul Custom. That's what he played most of the time, right? Uh, some of my favorite tunes, you know, Suicide Solution. I don't know. Diary of Madman, one of my favorite songs from Ozzy. You Can't Kill Rock and Roll, Flying High Again, Mr. Crowley. A lot of great songs, right? He just, um, he had this style that just, you know, he kind of was doing a little bit of that, like, uh, Eddie Van Halen thing, you know, with the tapping and all that kind of stuff, and the, the whammy bar, but he had this kind of classical sense because he was a classical student. So he mixed kind of classical and rock and roll um, and heavy metal in a really, really great way. And, uh, and you could tell he's one of those guys that was advancing leaps and bounds every week. Like, it, there's, no, there's no doubt in my mind that if he would have lived, he would have been <clears throat> so advanced within a couple of years that probably if he was around right now, he'd probably be doing stuff, you know, as many and we're going to talk about it in a little bit. He's talking about a guy like Sean Lane, right? Uh, I think that Randy Rhodes would be doing stuff equally as, as mesmerizing had he lived and if he was still around today. Dimebag Daryl Abbott. Left us in 2004 at age 38, killed by a gunman at a concert. Tragic, tragic, tragic day. I still remember um, where I was that day that that happened. I was actually out in Sebastopol, California. Uh, had a uh, sales meeting for the company I work for. I was out there for the week. I was sitting in my hotel room one morning and uh, Got a text from a friend of mine saying, have you read the news? I said, no. And I went and looked, on, and uh, there it was. And I was like, holy crap. Um, only had the uh, opportunity to see Pantera once. Uh, saw them open up for the Black Sabbath reunion in, God, what year was that, 90, 99? I don't even remember what year. Somewhere around there, late 90s. And uh, But, man, you know, some of those albums, Cowboys from Hell, Vulgar Display of Power, Far Beyond Driven. I mean, he was, for me one of the few kind of guitar gods that came out of the, the 90s, even though he was, he was playing in the 80s. But, I mean, he really came to prominence uh, throughout the early part of the 90s. And that was a decade where you weren't getting a lot of guitar heroes coming out of the woodwork. And I think he was one of them. And he was a talented guy because he could play with a lot of groove. But, man, that the guy was immense at creating riffs. And he was a terrific go-for-it-all soloist, right? Mostly played uh, Dean and Washburn guitars, right? In fact, they, Dean still has the uh, you know the dime guitar going today, and you know was, you can get pickups and wah wah pedals, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the guy was just a a terrific player. You know, Five Minutes Alone, Cemetery Gates, By Demons Be Driven, Cowboys from Hell, This Love, Becoming, Drag the Waters, Revolution is My Name. So many great Pantera songs that just showcase his just absolutely crunchy, molten riffing and terrific solos. Just uh, just an overwhelmingly fantastic player that, uh, again, what would he be doing today if he was still around? It's, just, it's hard, you know, when you think about some of this stuff. Uh, what else we got here? Dwayne Allman, another guy. Never really had the chance to really 
showed so much in those in those just couple years, and then poof, he's gone. And it's just like, man, what would Dwayne Allman be doing today if he was still around? You know, 1971, he leaves us at age 24. 24. Motorcycle accident. Man. Guy could rip it up on his Gibson Les Paul standard, all right? He also played SG, quite, SGs quite a bit. Uh, that first Allman Brothers Band album, self-titled, Out of Wild South, at the Fillmore East, Eat a Peach, the Layla and Other Stories album with Eric Clapton, just chock full of his great bluesy soloing, right? His just And he was a guy who could just kind of take it into the stratosphere. He's a good riff guy, too, and he could play a mean slide guitar. You know, just Whipping Post, In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, Trouble No More, Mountain Jam, Dreams, You Don't Love Me, Layla, Key to the Highway, why does love got to be so sad? I mean, just some terrific, terrific soloing on those albums. You know, go check out. He did some session work with Boz Skaggs, man. Some terrific stuff on there as well. Just a guy who, um, man, the sky's the limit, you know, at the time. And then, then he's gone, right? Very sad. Very sad. Frank Zappa left us in 1983 at age 52 due to complications from prostate cancer. Um Another guy, uh, nobody sounds like Zappa. He had a style all his own. Uh, he was a rock guy, but he had a jazz sensibility, and his soloing style just really didn't fit any kind of patterns of anything else. Um, <clears throat> and he played some cool riffs too. And he, you know, he had mostly played uh, Gibson SGs. Um, but you could see him, you know, especially in the eighties, he played a lot of strats All right, he started doing some stuff with the tremolo bar and all that kind of stuff. He occasionally played, um, Les Pauls. He had kind of like a honking sound. It's kind of hard to describe. His tone was really, really different. And, uh, you know, also was a good user of effects and wah-wahs and flangers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, hot rats, great guitar playing on that album. One size fits all Roxy and elsewhere overnight sensation. Joe's Garage has some terrific, terrific guitar work on it. The Grand Wazoo, if you want to hear a jazzier side to his playing. Uh, you know, songs like Inca Roads have that, you know, trademark Zappa solo on it. Peaches and Regalia, Cosmic Debris, More Trouble Every Day, Watermelon and Easter Hay. A lot of great stuff. If you, you know, if you really want to dive into Zappa and just hear his guitar playing, check out a lot of those uh, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar albums, which is mostly just his solos. Um, but really, man, there's just so much great Zappa guitar work on a lot of those albums, you know, and he's got a ton of them, got a ton of them. Um, and he, more importantly, he was just a master craftsman at putting together complex compositions. I mean, he was a songwriter. All right. And you say what you want about his lyrics, you love him or hate him. But man, the arrangements, the musical arrangements that he put together uh, on all of that old Zappa stuff. And he, you know, he was, he, he was always thinking, you know, not way more than guitar. It's like, well, how, how can we fit the, the, uh, the horns in here? How can we get the keyboards in here and the rhythms and all that kind of stuff? I mean, he's just a master, master composition specialist, just, um, incredible composer. Uh, Ronnie Montrose left us in 2012 at age 64, lived a nice long life, struggled with depression for many, 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 many years. Took his own life, unfortunately, but uh, another very influential guitar player, especially in the 70s. The, that first Montrose album, right, with Sammy Hagar, even the second one, Paper Money, all right, those first couple Gamma albums from the early, uh, was that, early 80s. How about his solo album, Speed of Sound, his all-instrumental solo album? That is fantastic if you haven't heard it. That came out right around the time where, you know, Satriani and Vi and Eric Johnson were starting to come out with these very popular Ingve solo releases, mostly guitar, right? And Ronnie was like, hey, I'm going to join this crowd. And man, Speed of Sound, great instrumental guitar album. You know, songs like Rock the Nation. The guy was a riffologist. Rock the Nation, Bad Motor Scooter, Space Station Number 5, Rock Candy. I got the fire. Fantastic. Four Horsemen. Voyager. God, the Gamma stuff is great also. Zero G. Go listen to Zero G. There's an instrumental song from the Speed of Sound album. Fantastic. Mostly was a Les Paul guy. All right, but I think he played some strats later in his career. Alvin Lee from 10 Years After. Also did a lot of solo stuff. Uh, lived a nice long life. Died in 2012, age 64, from complications from some s simple surgical procedure. I mean, that happens. You hear that a lot. That's why, like, it's always tough as you get older, you know. Surgery is not an easy thing, right? Um, 
mostly played throughout his career, his beloved Big Red, which was a Gibson ES-335, all right? Same guitar. There's very few guys who played like the same guitar throughout their entire career. Alvin's one of them, all right? He's always playing that. Uh, some of my favorite albums, uh, 10 years after albums, Cricklewood Green, A Space and Time, Shh, okay, Watts, a couple of the live albums, all good stuff. Uh, I'm Going Home is probably the most well-known song that he ever did. At the time, you know, 1969, he's playing at Woodstock, and he ripped into I'm Going Home with that opening solo, and people were just like, oh, my God, it's like the fastest shit I've ever seen, right? Uh, good Morning, Little Schoolgirl, I Woke Up This Morning, boop, beep, 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 beep. Great stuff. Uh, Love Like a Man, 50,000 Miles Beneath My Brain. One of these days, boy. <clears throat> I'd Love to Change the World. You Give Me Lovin', Choo Choo Mama, all great stuff. A fast, tasty player, but who also could do the slow, straight blues stuff too. Um, big fan. Love Alan. Great stuff. Chris Oliva from Sabotage. Another guy, an immense talent who left us way too soon. 1993, at age 30, died in a car accident, okay? Killed by a, this is the saddest part of all. Him and his wife hit by a drunk driver who already had seven arrests for drunken driving. Why is that guy even driving? People like that should not have a license anymore, right? But of course, there's really no way to stop that stuff, right? But that's the sad thing about it. It's, you know, it's... So tragic. Anyway, some of my favorite uh, Chris Oliva stuff. Uh, the Hall of the Mountain King album by Sabotage. Gutter Ballet. Power of the Night. Siren Streets. All chock full of amazing riff rama and blazing solos. I mean, he was just such a great player. And he had his style all his own. Uh, I believe title track to Gutter Ballet. Title track to Hall of the Mountain King. Warriors. Power of the Night. Siren. Strange Wings. 24 Hours Ago. Legions. Hounds. The Unholy. All terrific Sabotage songs with just absolutely spellbinding guitar work. <clears throat> like I said, the man had some great crunchy riffs, heavy riffs, uh, and his solos were just unbelievable as well. He, like, he had a really unique style. Uh, he played Charvel guitars. Right? He had that, I think it was the Charvel Predator, I think it was called. Always had that white Charvel. Amazing player. Man, miss him too. Uh, how about a guy who's not really much of a soloist, but still a tremendous, tremendous player? Uh, Malcolm Young. Okay, who left us in 2017 at age 64, all right, due to complication from dementia, the backbone of ACDC for all those years. You know, where would ACDC have been without those terrific riffs played on his beloved Gresh Jet Firebird guitar, right? I mean, that ACDC at its core was all about Malcolm's riffs. From Back in Black to High Voltage, Let There Be Rock, Highway to Hell. I mean, all those great albums and all the ones after it. You know, Hell's Bells, Riff Raff, Let There Be Rock, Sin City, Whole Lot of Rosie, Back in Black. For those about to rock, Girls Got Rhythm, Highway to Hell, Shoot to Thrill, doesn't matter. It's all, yeah, Angus is great too, right? And Angus's solos are kick-ass, but man, it's all about those in-the-pocket, tight, amazing riffs. Malcolm Young. <clears throat> Probably one of the best rhythm guitar players in rock and roll history Roy Buchanan all right left us in 1988 at the age of 48 another guy who struggled with depression for many years um and 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 problems with alcohol and uh, hung himself in a jail cell after getting arrested for uh, drunken disorderly like I said 48 way too young um another one of those guys that probably uh, a tremendous innovative player on his uh, Fender Telecaster all right he was more of a kind of like a bluesy, funky R&B type of guy. I uh, played some Les Pauls too, but he's mostly known for his uh, screaming licks on the Telecaster. Man, he could hit those pinch harmonics like crazy. Uh, also a pretty fast player when he wanted to. You know, his uh, self-titled Roy Buchanan, second album, Street Called Straight. A lot, of, a lot of intense albums there early in the career, but never a huge seller. Uh, he's the guy who wrote the, the Messiah Will Come Again, all right? Gary Moore kind of also did that and kind of brought that back to light. But go listen to the original. Quite good. Uh, my friend Jeff, a tribute to his friend Jeff Beck. Very good. A really great player. Great lead player. I think he more struggled with, the you know, what type of music should I be creating here? Because it's not quite country, not quite jazz, not quite rock. A little bit of blues, you know, a little bit. It's a little bit of everything. But, man, a tremendous player who just had killer, killer technique. Uh, Sean Lane. Left us in 2003 at age 40. Not a very healthy guy. He had all sorts of problems with psoriasis and things like that. And uh, he had a lot of bad re reactions to medication and things like that. And uh, left us way too young. Uh, an amazing player 
who, again, very well known among his guitar peers, but on in the general public, nobody knows who Sean Lane is. And that's a real shame. Uh, if you go listen to his Powers of Ten Live album or the uh, Centrifugal Funk with Frank Gambale, whew. How about the stuff with uh, Jonas Helborg and Jeff Sipe, right? The Time is the Enemy album, The Temporal and Analogs of Paradise. Tremendous guitar soloing. You know, this is not really mainstream music. It's not really jazz, not really rock. It's kind of fusion-y, right? Kind of proggy, but not. Um, the guy had tremendous technique. He's probably one of the fastest guitar players I've ever heard in my life. Um, but he could also play with a lot of taste and finesse, right? Um, mostly played Charvel guitars. He played, played Ibanez and Vigiers as well. But just, uh, he's one of those guys, man, when he burns, it's like the speed of light. Nobody faster. And again, you know, what, and he was just, his compositions were very complex and unique. No telling what he, he might have been able to do had he lived. Another master of the Telecaster left us way too soon. And, and par so paralleled with Roy Buchanan, Danny Gatton. All right, died in 1994, also age 49. They died almost the same time. Also well-known as a Telecaster guy, right? The, him and Roy B. In fact, I think he even bought one of Roy Buchanan's old Telecasters. Roy was kind of his hero. Uh, Danny Gatton, um, Redneck Jazz Explosion, 88 Elmira Street was his kind of big album. Uh, Blazing Telecasters, another good album. It just uh, He also kind of bluesy, kind of country, kind of, kind of R&B type of thing. Um on the Telecaster, he also played a Gibson ES350, but another guy who could play <clears throat> just about any style, and his technique was absolutely jaw-dropping. Also suffered from de depression. Also took his own life. Very sad. All right, how about uh, the two Beatles, right? Got to mention those guys. Um, George Harrison. Left this in 2001, age 58, okay? After a bat we'll battle with cancer. Um, George was prone to Gresh guitars. He also played some Tellys and Strats and Rickenbackers early in, in the Beatles' career. You know, I don't think either Lennon or Harrison well known for, you know, monster solos. But man, as far as tasty layers and rhythms and all that kind of stuff and riffs, uh, both really great and probably don't get enough credit for their, their guitar playing. You know, his solo album, Everything Must Pass, has some great, great stuff on it. Uh, I think I love his playing on Revolver, Rubber Soul, The White Album, Abbey Road, <clears throat> you know. What is Life, My Sweet Lord, you know, use of the sitar and very kind of like ethnic sounding passages and things. <clears throat> uh, if I Needed Someone, Tax Man, Helter Skelter, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. He's a great songwriter, too. Got to mention that. He wrote that song, right? With Eric Clapton in mind. The two of them played some great stuff on that. Uh, I Want You, She's So Heavy, Here Comes the Sun. You know, great songwriter, great guitar player. It's maybe not guitar hero when you think of guitar heroes, but, man, just as important, okay? John Lennon, too, all right? Maybe not as much of a solo player as, as Harrison was, but another guy who was a great creator of, of layers and riffs and things like that. Left us in 1980 at age 40, of killed by a gunman, right? Uh, big in Rickenbacker guitars. He played the Epiphone Casino, all right? Fender Strat. Solo album Imagine and Double Fantasy. Some tasty guitar playing on there, right? He's all over the White Album as well. Abbey Road, Sgt. Pepper, Help. You know, there's a lot of really cool Lennon uh, licks and things like that on a lot of those albums. So again, you know, why while, while these two guys may not, you know, instantly come to mind alongside, you know, guys like Hendrix and whatnot, but I just really important players. Really important players and such an integral part of all those classic Beatles records. Let's go over back to metal. Chuck Schuldner. All right. Left us in two thousand one at age thirty-four, uh, due to complications from uh, brain cancer. You know. Played the hell out of that BC Rich guitar. BC, I believe it was the Stealth, right? A custom BC Rich guitar. One of the most important guitar players to the early extreme metal scene uh, in his band Death, right? You know, burst on the scene in the late 80s with Scream Bloody Gore. Uh, but then, you know, early, mid-90s started taking Death to these really sophisticated, more progressive death metal avenues, Okay, very technical playing, very melodic and almost jazz fusion-y soloing on albums like Human, Symbolic, Sounds of Perseverance, and Individual Thought Patterns. Uh, some great playing, great tasty playing on these albums. Uh, Suicide Machine, Crystal Mountain, The Philosopher, Zero Tolerance, Symbolic, Spirit Crusher, Scavenger of Human Sorrow. Again, another one of those guys, had he lived, man, no telling what he'd be doing today. I think he would have been one of those guys because he was already um, moving away from death metal 
with the last band he was in before he passed away, Control Denied. Uh, and I think he was already moving into other types of kind of classic metal type stuff, progressive metal, all right? And no telling what he would have done. Um, just a, another really, really big loss. All right, since we're 40 minutes in, uh, I'm going to just kind of mention some other guys that I had on my list. And again, there's a lot more than these, but these are some other ones that I, I really always appreciate um, a lot and miss. Uh, Al, Alan Collins from Lynn & Skinner. Very tasty player and, you know, such a big part of that two or three guitar attack. Steve Gaines from Leonard Skinner. Okay, he was the guy who joined them last, right before the plane crash. Another one of those guys, really talented player, good songwriter. Um, if that plane crash never happened, man, I really think that that, that lineup of Skinner would have been just absolutely enormous. Uh, Prince, <clears throat> fantastic player. Say what you want about his music, either like it or you don't. Um, you know, the funk, pop type of thing, R&B. But man, that guy could play guitar. He, I think if Prince really wanted to, if he really wanted to, he could have been the next Jimi Hendrix. Okay, if he wanted to just stay in the rock realm, okay, and just pump out kind of bluesy, acid rock type of stuff, he could have done that and he would have been terrific at it. He was still terrific at what he did. Right, but a tremendous, tremendous player. Uh, Jerry Garcia, Grateful Dead. You don't have to be a deadhead to appreciate the guitar playing of Jerry Garcia. Another very unique guy, very kind of liquid, liquid sound, very tasty. Right, he could jam and go into uncharted territories. Um, really, really good player. Very unique. BB um, King. You know, say what you want about uh, you know maybe his playing might be a little one dimensional, but you hear one note by B.B. King, <clears throat> you know it's B.B. King. One of the tastiest players ever. Could say so much with just a couple notes. And sometimes it's all you need, right? It's all you need. And so much credit to the guy. And I've seen him, I saw him live, and it was like a great experience. Seeing him in a club full of people, and, and you know, it's like he walks out, and he takes control of everything. And he just, you know, plays those stinging notes, just sweet, sweet stuff. Uh, Michael Hedges. One of the most innovative guys ever uh, on kind of like acoustic guitar. Doing things that nobody else did, all different tunings and stuff like that. Just uh, an amazing player that, uh, unfortunately, you know, I remember he was pretty, starting to get pretty well known, right, when I was starting to kind of listen to jazz and some different stuff. And then before you know it, he was gone. And I would have loved to have had a chance to see him live at least once. Glenn Buxton from the original Alice Cooper group. Really good player. Could play some tasty solos. Good, you know, riffs alongside Michael Bruce. Another really good, good, good player. Can, such a big part of those early Alice Cooper albums. Sid Barrett from Pink Floyd. All right. Very different player. Very avant-garde style. All right. Really worked well with that early psychedelia that Pink Floyd were doing. All right. Unfortunately, you know, the mind couldn't, you know, it kind of went in different directions. It's a shame, you know, to have these guys who, like, probably were, you know, secret geniuses that just never got to fully explore all their talents. Jeff Healy, all right, the great blues rock, blind blues rockman, okay, he would play sitting down in that weird style, right, he played it almost like a key, plays guitar almost like a keyboard, right, like like a pedal steel, uh, but man, could he wail, and a great singer too, great songwriter. Uh, Mick Ronson, terrific player from... Uh, Ziggy Stardust era of David Bowie, The Spiders from Mars. Kick-ass player. He, he was like, probably like the quintessential glam rock guitar player and a guitar hero. Right? He looked the part, sounded the part. Dick Wagner, another guy made made himself famous in uh, the Alice Cooper solo career, right? Contribute a lot to those uh, early Alice Cooper albums. You know, Welcome to My Nightmare alongside uh, Mr. Steve Hunter, okay? As well as he contributed some stuff to a couple Aerosmith songs, as well as with uh, Lou Reed, right? Very good player. Very good player. Lowell George from Little Feet. Master bluesman. Slide guitar maestro. Great songwriter and singer. Missed. Toy Caldwell from the Marshall Tucker Band. A amazing player. Man, he could wring some serious notes out of that uh, Gibson Les Paul. Good singer also. Contributed some lead vocals to Marshall Tucker's uh, early repertoire. Uh, also played some great pedal steel guitar. But man, he was just a terrific, terrific uh, lead guitarist with a great tone. Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones. All right. 
one half of that great early guitar team alongside Keith Richards. Another really good player who had a real feel for the blues. All right, the band, you know, once he left the band and passed away, you know, they really kind of changed. But those early stones are full of a lot of great blues and R&B. A lot of that's due to him. All right. <clears throat> How about Les Paul? Kind of the guy who started it all. all. Right. Lived a nice long life. Complete innovator. He, he was a master technician, Les Paul. All right. As well as a great guy creating gadgets and electronics and things like that. My last two from Molly Hatchett, Dave Lubeck and Dwayne Rollin, both excellent players. I mean, the, the Southern rock genre has just been decimated by deaths from some of their, uh, you know, influential early players in a lot of these great bands. And those two guys were part of that great guitar trio in Molly Hatchett in the early years. Uh, you know, um, they're both missed as well. So, um, yeah, there you have it. Lots of guys. Lots of guys. Any quick stories I can tell? Uh, only got to see Gary Moore once. Very memorable show. All right. Uh, that was tour in his uh, hard rock phase. I saw him in a little club in Poughkeepsie, New York. Rory Gallagher I only saw once. Uh, he opened up for Rush at the Meadowlands, I believe. It was at the Madison Square Garden, one of the two. Uh, and I remember I really hadn't really heard much of Rory Gallagher at the time. And I was like, oh, this guy's pretty good. Uh, Steve Ray Vaughan I caught twice. I caught him in a small uh, theater early on. I could tell he was he was kind of messed up at the time, but he played really well. He's up there sweating profusely and just not, not really talking to the crowd much and just playing. You can kind of tell when some of these guys are like, you know, something's going on there. But And then I saw him uh, at Madison Square Garden with Jeff Beck uh, opening up uh, after he had gotten clean, and that was a terrific concert about a year before he passed away. Uh, Holdsworth I got to see once, all right, uh, part of that jazz explosion thing with Stanley Clark and uh, Steve Smith and Randy Brecker. Uh, that was fantastic. Got to meet him at the bar. Very cool. Very cool to just walk up to the bar, and there's Alan Holdsworth sitting there sipping a beer. <laughs> it's like, you know, very cool. Uh, Johnny Winter, like I said, I got to meet him once. Randy Rhodes uh, I got to see. Uh, most, I think, all these other guys. I never saw Zappa. Never got to see Montrose or Alvin Lee. Uh, I saw Sabotage once. So I got to see Chris Oliva in a small club. Uh, ACDC I did not see with Malcolm. He had already had left the band. He was uh, retired from the band just before he passed away. Uh, any of these other guys that I get to see? I, I saw Chuck Schuldner. I saw Death once way, way back in, like, God, 89 or 90, something like that. And I think that is it on these guys. saw so Jeff Healy once. Um, that's about it, I think. Oh, and I got to see uh, the, the the Molly Hatchet guys very early on. I saw them on the Beating the Odds tour, which was pretty cool. Three Guitar Army up there, right? So there you have it. There's my tribute to some of our fallen guitar legends and heroes. Uh, like I said, I know there's some that I probably forgot, so feel free to list them below. Or feel free to tell any stories about any of these guys or why you love them or some of your favorites from them. Because I think uh, it, it's worth keeping the spirit of them and their music alive in all of us. Because uh, these, these are guys you're never, gonna, you're never ever going to forget. And thankfully we have their music that we can continue to listen to for months and years and decades ahead, right? So visit us on the web at www.cetranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, of course, we're on YouTube all the damn time. Coming up uh, later today, we got a Monsters Den episode for you. All right, so that'll be coming up later this afternoon. And then uh, starting this week, we're going to do my favorite releases from each year. Um, I, I, I'm either going to do them every day or every other day. Starting in 1965, we're going to go all the way to the present. So I'm going to look at the entire year's worth of releases and somehow pick one album that's my favorite from the year, and I'm going to ask everybody to do the same. All right, so that's how that's going to work. All right, so guys, have a good rest of the weekend. I'll see you on the Monsters Den. Don't miss it. Uh, otherwise, take care. Have a good one. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.